You know, I knew that I couldn't quit drinking. I tried and I failed. And I thought that I found my answer. Meaning? I hung myself. It's the Channel Mom Show with Jenny Dean Schmidt. We're here for you. Give your face a polished glow with moisturizing pomegranate facial polish for just a penny now through February 26th. Click on the Lemongrass Spa ad next to this video to order your treat sized jar for a penny with any regularly priced purchase. Never let go. We played that song on purpose. David Crowder Band, Never Let Go. Welcome back to the Channel Mom Show. We have an amazing guest today, and I played that song for a reason. Ariel's Light is being called an inspiring true story of recovery, healing, hope, and miracles. Hence the song. We are here with Heidi Marie Davis today, the author of Ariel's Light. Heidi had her first taste of alcohol in elementary school, and although she doesn't remember what it tasted like, she does remember that she liked the way it made her feel. Fast forward to adulthood, and Heidi Davis is now a grown woman with a loving husband. They've had five beautiful children together, but she admits that through it all, she loved to drink. Apparently, Heidi justified her alcohol dependency until it was too late, and she woke up to find herself lost and in despair. Heidi's going to take it from here. Mother and author of the book, Ariel's Light, welcome to the Channel Mom Show, Heidi. Oh, thank you. I'm so grateful to be here. Oh, what an honor. Well, we're glad to have you. Thank you. Okay, so just tell people, because I know there are people out there that have had uh, addicts in their life or have struggled with addiction themselves. How did it all start for you and where did it go? Well, I started drinking at a very young age and it, and it was um, a social thing. It was just, you know, as, as a young child, we snuck it. I have a bunch of cousins and we were always with our family and, and we would sneak drinks mm -hmm. and it turned into be just something you know how to have fun and then it turned into the only way I knew how to have fun okay and and so really it was that it was that you liked the way it made you feel oh yeah did you did you think did you have that thing where you felt like it made you more likable to other people that it made you more fun oh absolutely I, you know I had a lot of courage I would do and say things that um, you know I never would when I was sober it, okay. it does give you that courage and at what age did you realize that you really needed it on a, on a daily basis? You really craved it? You didn't feel like you were yourself or, or you could be uh, have a good time without it? Well, the, f the first time I think that I actually realized that maybe there was something more than just having fun is I was in, and, and not a lot of people know this. One of my good friends, um, Kelly, knows this about me, but I had, I had hid beer under my bed when I was probably 14. And, and my, I remember her questioning me like, wow, you know, Heidi, maybe you got to think about that. Um, but not, I don't, I don't think I've ever shared that with anybody. Tell right now. Sorry, mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, her mom's in the studio learning that she stored beer under her bed at age 14. So you realized at that point, and she realized at that point that you really wanted it around. Like, so would you have it before you went to bed or we have it when you woke up in the morning or? Uh, more in, in, at nighttime. I mean, I, I think at that age, I wasn't quite the morning drinker, but you know, it really didn't matter. Um. It just, it was, it was that it was there. I think it was almost like a security blanket at that point. Yeah. And then tell me how it progressed. So, so you're in high school, um, you get married to your wonderful husband, Kevin, and you continue to drink more and more. How, what's your pattern? How, what, what, what's unfolding at that point? Well, you know, as I grew older um, and my friends, everybody started to grow up and I didn't. It became um, more of a need than, you know, um, a pleasure I guess for some people a treat people would go out and have a good time and for me it was um, we'd go out and I and I would I wouldn't just have the social you know cocktails I would drink until I passed out or blacked out and and then you know during the days I'd start drinking a little bit earlier and a little bit earlier in the day and then it, it just became more and more mm -hmm. um, I want anybody who has walked through addiction or is struggling with addiction or has somebody in their life who's struggling with addiction to understand that you understand w what is it about addiction if you can just say i know what you're going through today um what would you say if you could describe it needing that drink i mean i, I mean obviously i can understand it but but um i haven't struggled with that particular thing so what is it what is it that keeps drawing a person back and th that 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 it consumes their life T tell me a little bit about that 
Well, I think that the one way to describe, because a lot of people can't understand, you know, my husband for so long would just say, just don't go to the liquor store. And it was, I never thought, you know, I never woke up in the morning and says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to drink so much that I make a fool out of myself, not make dinner, um, fight with my husband, fight with my children. What I did was just say, I'm just going to have a quick drink. Nobody's looking. And then what it's like after that, it's like to describe an alcoholic. It's like a, uh, a shark that tastes blood. You oh. just can't stop. You can't, that's, you have a one track mind. That's just the only thing that you think about. And I think that for me, I lived in such denial that I always thought, well, I wasn't going to do that again. You know, I, I won't do it next time and I can control it next time. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a great description, the, sh the shark with blood thing. It's a great description because I'm sure that then, then you just ruminate on it. When you've had that first drink, then you just think, okay, when do I get the next one? When do I, you know, mm -hmm. right? You, you obsess. You constantly, you obsess over it until you get it into your body. And then once it goes into your body, you can't stop. Yeah. And what did your home life look like? I mean, you had five kids. Yeah. It was, it was messy. It was um, just chaotic, my life was, you know, and it was, being an alcoholic, it's very selfish because you're just concerned about, you know, you and the drink and then you're doing the damage control. So it really just revolves around, well, me is what it revolved around. Yeah. And, uh, so let's get into what finally brought it to a head. Um, what, did your kids say stuff to you? Did, when, what happened that you finally decided, I can't do this anymore? Well, for 12 years, 12 solid years from the time I was 21, that's when I first started to stop drinking. And every time I stopped, I thought I can get it under control. And um, so you would stop for periods of time. Okay, so you reached a point at which you decided I gotta, I gotta stop. But that that went on for a while. Explain that. Yes, I I had always drank so much where you know I mean my husband had just was at his wit's end. My mom was worried. My dad, uh, my family, and so I'd stop and just to try to get it back under control. And I always thought that I was going to start over. And you know every time I picked up, you know I'd stop for thirty days, two weeks. A um, couple months. I went all the way up to ten months one time stopping, and and I thought that. And what happens is when you start drinking, if you're an alcoholic, that you pick up right where you left off. Oh. And then it progresses each time. Well, it gets. Oh, yeah. it gets worse. You pick up right where you left off the last time you quit drinking, and then it just gets worse and worse. So it's like you you start at your bottom, and then you hit another bottom, and you start doing things that you know you swore you never would. You cross lines and boundaries that you promised yourself, your family. And that's how I knew because a normal drinker doesn't have to do that. You know, when you say you crossed a line or a boundary, um, what does that mean? Well, you know, driving never, never would I drive drunk with my kids in the car. Never would I drink and drive. Well, yeah. all of a sudden, you know, it just, I'm just going to run up to the store and all of a sudden you do that. And, <clears throat> um, just things, uh, I would never miss one of my kids' performances at school. I would never take any alcohol just to the school, you know, sneak it. And then I started sneaking it in, um, in the water bottles and things like that. Those are the sort of things that you promised you'd never do. Oh, so it did. So each time you'd quit and then you'd go back and it would get worse. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what happened the final time? The final time, um, I, my husband had just had absolutely enough and he is my best friend and I'm his best friend. And, and what happened was, is that he said he just couldn't, I couldn't be around the kids anymore because I was a danger to them and myself. Because of the way you'd cook or the way it just, like you'd leave the stove on. I mean like, oh yeah, things like that would happen. I'd black out. You'd black out. And so then you were there with your five babies mm -hmm. and, and putting them in. So he was telling the truth. You were yeah, literally I mean, putting them in danger. Absolutely. Yeah. He couldn't trust me. I couldn't be trusted. I couldn't be trusted. Um, you know, to to uh, to take care of my children. I mean, I was a loose cannon basically. By that point, I had hit that point, you know, of progression where. And he just told me it was time. It was time. I need to go stay with my mom and get help. He says he, he's going to be right here waiting. Um, but as far as he was concerned, the marriage, you know, he couldn't have it. Well, kudos to him. First of all, I mean, we we talk a lot about marriage on this show, and and we're not here to condemn anybody who has has is single or has gone through divorce, uh, that's not our point. Our point is, if you're in a marriage, work so hard to keep it together because it's better for the kids, it's better for society, it's just better all around. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's a God-created thing, marriage. It's a beautiful thing. So kudos to Kevin. Um, so he, tell, he tells you, you need to go start taking care of this. And what happened from there? What did you do? 
Well, I think it's really important to know that that was so crucial for me in my in my bottom when Kevin and my mom and they just said, you know what, enough is enough. We we love you, but we are not going to this is not acceptable in our life. They were going to do anything they could to help me in my sobriety, but they were not going to support my alcoholism mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. So finally, when I knew he was done, that's what triggered. And I, and I ended up leaving. By the grace of God, I was only gone for one night. But that's where my bottom, you know, I, I ended up going to this abandoned shack with uh, my girls. Because after I left, they, were, they thought they'd just drive me around for a while. And, your, until I your daughters. Them, my daughters, Ariel and Allison, and their friend Haley. And we ended up going to this shack, and I just, they, they called it the dollhouse because there was this doll hanging on a chain. And so when they went outside, I thought, you know, I was at that point, like, I thought, I don't know what I was thinking, I mean, other than about myself, that I had found my way out. You know, I knew that I couldn't quit drinking. I tried and I failed, and I thought that I found my answer. Meaning? I hung myself. I took the doll down, and I put the chains around my neck, and not thinking about them, not thinking about what this is going to cause due to my daughters um, to find, take their dead mom down. Never thought about that. All I thought about was me. And I'm in so much pain and I'm so tired of causing everybody pain that if I just get rid of the source of the pain, then everybody was going to be good. Yeah. Well, I t put the chains around my neck and I just let go. And the girls were outside and Ariel looked in through the, the window and she see me and she just screamed bloody murder and she ran in and got me. She got you down. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, uh, we left that place immediately. And then they, what did she say to you? She said, well, she just probably, she, you know, how could you do this to us, mom? What about us? How could you do this to us? That's all she kept saying. And, and, um, and I wasn't thinking about them. I was thinking about me. Uh, yeah. That's all I knew how to do at that point was just thinking about my wants, my needs, my desires. But the, the thing is, is that it was so, out of my hands I was so lost and it wasn't um I wasn't trying to be like that it's just what the alcoholism made me it turned me into sure sure I understand that I do in the last minute just briefly tell people before we go to the next segment she has an incredible end to the story um that includes Ariel w what would did you go to a treatment program no I didn't I um we stayed the night at a motel um, and it was Ariel, myself, and Haley. Allison, she tried, but I just, I was mean and cruel, and she was done with it, and I don't blame her. God bless her little soul. Mm -hmm. um, but Ariel was right there, and when I woke up, I mean, it just she was just illuminated. And, and I looked, it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, and I just thought, oh, my gosh, what have I done? And it was seeing her face, that her staying by my side, you know, she was that light that I needed to see, that hope that I needed to see, that I didn't want to die. I just didn't want to be in pain. Yeah. And she gave me that hope. Um, and I knew that for me, it was, I went back to a 12-step program. And, um, and that for me, I just, I surrendered everything inside of me to God. But it was because of Ariel that she didn't leave me. Um, God used her. Absolutely. So he, he. He had her be faithful to you just as he's faithful. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, coming back, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, her recovery and how Ariel stood by her side, and then the rest of the story, which you're not going to want to miss. If you'd like to win a copy of Heidi Marie Davis's book, Ariel's Light, about addiction and recovery, 303-297-1510, even to give it to somebody else, please call 303-297-1510 to win Ariel's Light. And please stay tuned as we come back with Heidi Marie Davis, the author of Ariel's Light, for the rest of her story.